1960s, uh, where we started a friendship that's lasted for over 30 years. Masaki completed his BSc and MSc degrees in Japan before coming to Waterloo to complete his PhD thesis under the guidance of Drs. Rudolph and, and Dr. Garth Vanderkamp. Uh, he completed his PhD in 1996 here at the here at the and has been a faculty member at the University of Calgary ever since for about 25 years now. Throughout his career, Masaki has been completing impactful research, over 120 journal papers, in areas that he identified as needing additional data, knowledge, and understanding. His research areas have focused on prairie hydrogeology, uh, including wetland function, alpine hydrology as demonstrated through his 2018 Darcy Lecture Series, groundwater recharge in the prairie settings, and understanding the complexity of frozen ground and permafrost in northern region hyd hydrology. His papers are insightful and impactful, and as such, they are routinely referenced. I've done so many times myself. His contributions have been recognized through awards that include the Henry Darcy Lecturer, uh, being named a Fellow of the Geological Society of America, a long-term uh, Canada Research Chair in Hydrology, and most recently, the winner of the 2023 IAH RN Farvolden Award. So congratulations on that as well, Masaki. Above all, Masaki is an exceptional person with a very friendly personality, a willingness to help all those around him. He freely shares his knowledge and understanding with all those who ask. I personally cherish his wisdom and his understanding and that he shared with me over the years, and I look forward to the talk today. I'll learn more about the role of Canadian research in advancing groundwater hydrology. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Masaki Hyashi to the stage. Well, thank you, Paul, for such an overly generous uh, introduction. <laughs> Um, so I, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone for coming here. Thank you um, to uh, the online audience as well. Um, so uh, 33 years ago, um, uh, September 1990, Bob Fawalden uh, brought me uh, from Japan to here to start my PhD. So it's, um, you know, a tremendous honor uh, to be standing here and then uh, Give, uh, give a lecture named after uh, Bob for Bolden. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a, a great feeling. So the story today um, is uh, not really technical in the sense that uh, it's a, uh, what we call historical sketches. Um, so Garth Vanderkamp and I uh, wrote a paper recently uh, about uh, some of the historical uh, moments uh, of Canadian hydrogeology. This is not meant to be a comprehensive review of the history, but some of the things we saw that was uh, quite interesting and meaningful. So, um, so I'm just uh, giving you snippets uh, from our paper. So Garth is uh, here. Uh, so this picture was taken at uh, Lake Ohara in Canadian Rockies when we went hiking a couple, well, several years ago before COVID. Uh, so Garth is now retired uh, in a town near Victoria, and he says hello to those uh, of you who know Garth. Uh, oh, sorry, I got to say something about this. So the uh, history really started with exploration of uh, groundwater resources uh, as a water supply for various uses. And Canadian Railway uh, uh, was a major user because it was, you know, locomotive, steam train, you need a lot of water to drive the train. Uh, and then this was uh, later on, uh, so big pumping test uh, in the Estevan Valley Aquifer, which is southern Saskatchewan near the US border. There are actually a couple of famous people here. A, uh, Bill Walton, uh, he you know, wrote influential textbooks on pumping tests, and Bill Minnelli, who, who founded the Groundwater Group of Saskatchewan Research Council. Uh, now, so, as I said, so the beginning was all about finding water uh, for uh, the people and the organization who needed it. So the one of the earliest written account of uh, groundwater investigation was done by Geological Survey Canada, GSC, uh, for water supply for railway in Saskatchewan. And then in the 1930s and 40s, so the GSC kind of pulled back a little bit from this kind of work and then the water groundwater investigation um, was kind of passed on to the provincial agencies. Alberta was the one, the first, and then Ontario, 
uh, followed by Nova Scotia, Quebec uh, in the 50s. Um, and then it was still you know, about well, finding water uh, for water supply. And then something changes in 1955 uh, when Bob uh, became the head of newly created uh, groundwater division of uh, Research Council of uh, Alberta. So at this point, he just finished his master's in hydrogeology at the U of A, University of Alberta in Edmonton, and he was heading this new division. And then Bob, like he always had, he had a vision. So that was, because the mandate was still there. You need to you know, do this, you know, site specific, you know, user specific investigation of groundwater. But at the same time, he's, he said, you know, we need to do studies that helps us determine the nature, extent and proper development of valuable resources. So in other words, he's saying that we sh really shouldn't be engaging in research unless it helps to generate the broadly applicable scientific knowledge. There's a kind of major turn in the direction of uh, groundwater investigation. Now, so I'll tell you a little bit, bit about uh, Bob. Um, so uh, uh, as uh, some of you might know, uh, he's from a little town called uh, Forestburg uh, in Alberta. It's just southeast of Edmonton. So 2016, um, I was asked to give a, a you know, little seminar for the watershed conservation group uh, uh, and then it was in uh, Forestburg. So knew, knowing that Bob was from uh, Forestburg, I was just, oh, this is cool. And I get to visit his uh, hometown. And I was just kind of wondering if I see any trace of Bob for Bob. And, and I was skeptical, oh, well, that, that's possibly so long ago. And then you drive into the main street of uh, Forestburg and the first thing you see is this. Uh, it, the slide is a bit dark, but um, it, says, oh, sorry, uh, Forboden Center. Um, so, um, so this Forboden Center hosts uh, Canada Post and uh, the public library. So I thought, wow, I got to just go in and ask the librarian. So what's, what's the story with this name? So uh, the librarian kindly uh, told me, well, there is actually a town history book uh, in our library. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's got a cover of this. Um, so th this town actually a two industry town, um, agriculture and uh, coal mining and the coal, fi uh, coal fire, the power production. And then this was uh, a few months after the Alberta government announced they're gonna shut down all the coal fired power plants. So there are a lot of sales signs uh, on properties. It was a kind of sad, but anyways, I walked in and then I picked it, uh, picked this up and then you find the, you know, something about all the families in town. And then we find that the Bob's, Bob was the fifth, you know, youngest sibling of uh, the brothers and sisters of five. And his father came to Canada from a place called the Forbolen uh, in Norway. I guess it's anglicized the Forbolen. And this is in a, not very far from Oslo uh, uh, in the region of Telemark. You know, that's where the, you know, the Telemark skiing uh, comes from. Uh, and then it talks about uh, Bob as well. This was published in the early 80s. So uh, it mentions about him coming to Waterloo and become the Dean of Science and all that. Uh, and then it has this uh, picture of uh, Bob and his uh, wife, June. Uh, this was their wedding uh, picture in 1954. And then he became the uh, head of the uh, Grand Order Division uh, for Alberta Research Council. So now, and there are many things uh, Bob did uh, in Alberta. Uh, so one of the things is uh, the, uh, you know, the development of this, uh, the Q20 method, which every hydrogeologist in Alberta knows what the Q20 is. Uh, but th th he wrote a little report in 1959. Um, so this was kind of his effort to, you know, develop some tools that are generally applicable for water resource evaluation. So the idea was, okay, we can use uh, the TICE theory, uh, then it was only about 20 years old, to uh, estimate the long-term yield. Uh, so, well, you have this ideal TICE aquifer and then you do a pumping test. Uh, 
So this is actually actual pumping test I did in a little town uh, in southern Alberta. Uh, so you can determine uh, T and S, as you, we all know from a hydrogeology course. But Bob's idea was, OK, well, once we get the T and S, and then we can stretch it to 20 years. Um, so you, you get this 20 year drawdown. So if this drawdown is permissible uh, based on the geological and hydrogeological condition, we allow you know, long term pumping at this rate, Q20. So now you immediately recognize there are some flaws in this approach. First of all, there is no such thing as an ideal TICE aquifer. All the aquifers have boundaries. And also, there might be more than one well pumping from the same aquifer, but at the time, uh, it was uh, adequate. Um, now, so the problem is that we're still using it. You know, 60 years later, we're still doing this, you know, short-term pumping test, stretched over 20 years and determine the long-term sustainable yield. Uh, so if Bob had found out about this, he would roll in his grave. Um, so Garth and I are trying to you know, change this mindset to something more of a 21st century, but it's, uh, it's difficult sometimes. You know, established tradition uh, goes along. Uh, now, okay, so to achieve that vision, you know, just generate you know, new scientific knowledge. He hires a bunch of young uh, hydrogeologists. Um, this is just a couple examples. Uh, Peter Maiboom, uh, he brought him from uh, Holland. Uh, he was a quaternary geologist. He, Peter became a hydrogeologist. Um, so the, uh, Dick Jackson was asking me on the other day, um, so who brought piezometer to Canada? Uh, I think Peter Maiboom was maybe not the first one, but really he popularized the use of piezometers. You know, the uh, monitoring well was a short uh, screen. Uh, and then Bill Menelli, uh, he, those two were trained by Favold, and then Peter uh, established the uh, groundwater division, or the, became the head of the groundwater division of uh, GSC, and then Bill, of course, went to Saskatchewan and founded the SRC's uh, groundwater division along with Earl Christensen. And then this guy <coughs> joined uh, RCA, the Research Council. So. This was about the time Bob was leaving a research council. So whether I'm not clear whether uh, uh, Joseph Toth, or we know him as a Joe Toth, was hired by Bob or Peter Maibu. But anyways, he joined uh, the research council. And this is a legendary you know, picture of the legendary field trip on the, and Joe had a eureka moment to come up with that. You know, the, the picture that was portrayed upside down in the uh, freezer and cherry. <coughs> Uh, so this is my room and Toth uh, camping at the Tolman Ferry campground uh, on a field trip. Um, so Joe, actually, I was born the same year Emil Friend was born, 1933, and I just called him up a few days ago just to get a permission to use this uh, picture. And he's still healthy, and then he's uh, still kicking around. Uh, so this, you know, the campground, so the ferry has been replaced by the uh, bridge uh, but it's still, campground is still there. So uh, sometimes uh, when the international visitor comes, I just take them out there. Like, well, this is the birthplace of the groundwater flow system. They always get a kick out of it. And they usually take, you know, selfies and all that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyways, okay. So well, Joe, Joe was not trained as a hydrogeologist. He was a geophysicist. Um, so. Either Bob or Peter Maiboom uh, told him, well, you got to read, uh, read this book, uh, the, the paper uh, by M.K. Hubbard. Uh, so if you have seen this paper, you, you know that this is almost 200 pages uh, long. And then Joe actually went from cover to cover, like I did um, when I was studying for the comps um, many years ago. So the, much of this, this is equations after equation, but the real contribution of this paper is in establishing the sound basis of hydrogeology based on the potential theory. And then towards the end of this 200 pages long paper, paper you, you got this diagram almost as a, an appendix. Oh, by the way, uh, you could do something like this using potential theory. You see it's a figure 45, it's towards the end of the, of the paper. But at the time, okay, so Favolin had a vision to um, just kind of change hydrogeology from pumping test, you know, aquifer hydraulics, 
only to more basin based, you know, so you want to look at the uh, basin and then look at the groundwater in the context of basin scale hydrologic cycle. So Joe must have, you know, thought, oh, this is great. I can use this. So th this picture uh, has this, you know, flow lines uh, coming from the recharge areas and converging to uh, this little creek. Uh, so this is a point sink in this potential theory. Um, now, so Joe and Peter Mybroom just went around, but then, you know, what Joe saw was just a dry creek and there's no converging of flow line into the center of this uh, uh, valley. Uh, oh, okay, lose it. Okay. Now, so he uh, kind of, you know, came upon this idea. Um, okay, so I'll just show you. So th th this, this is the solution of uh, Laplace's equation, but it, Harvard didn't actually solve the equation. He just took the diagram from potential theory and then, okay, what's well, the Laplace's equation? It should look, look like this. So it's a conceptually based in a way. So Joe uh, decides to solve it with appropriate boundary conditions. And then what happened is some greatness of Joe that uh, I'm just going to talk about it in a few minutes. But from this vantage point of 21st century hydrogeologist, I can look back and then, you know, reflect on something that's, you know, <clears throat> unique to the prairies environment. So this is called the standard pre precipitation index. It's basically the uh, dark blue uh, is the, the period with, uh, wet condition and the red is a drought, right? So the prairies, there's drought and deluge and it repeats every five, 10 years. And then right now we're in the middle of the drought that we're somewhere around here. So groundwater level is depressed, all the creeks are dry. And Joe Toss arrives in Alberta in the middle of a 10 year drought and he sees this and they do some great things. So had Joe arrived in Alberta five years earlier or five years later, you know, story would have been different. It's kind of something to think about. Hmm, it's really good that Joe arrived in the middle of the, uh, the drought. So this is what he did. Um, so he sets up this, um, the model domain and using a pencil and uh, paper, he solves this Laplace's uh, equation and uh, um, Many of you have seen this picture, but uh, <clears throat> some of only some of you know that this is actually confined aquifer. It's not an unconfined water table aquifer, and this upper boundary is actually piezometric surface, not the uh, water table, because it's a pencil and paper. The equation has to be linear, so Joe had to assume a confined aquifer and then develop this solution. And also another thing he assumed is just sloping, a flat slope you know, straight sloping piezometric surface. And with that, he gets this idea that entire half of the model domain is a discharge area. So that's quite a bit different from this conceptually based, you know, flow nets where everything converges to uh, the, the creek, the point sink. Now, so this is a little bit extreme in my taste. You know, you don't really have this flat aquifer that, you know, six kilometer long linear slope. So in reality, the you know, hill slope will look like this. So this is a contemporary uh, simulation of the same thing Joe did, but th this is actually the water table boundary condition. Now, so you don't really get the point sink. So the riparian area actually receives a lot of groundwater discharge. Okay. Now, so when you look at the figure, uh, so you notice that the scale is actually quite odd. You know, th th this was supposed to be for small river beds in the stream uh, watershed. So six kilometers of horizontal scale, that's okay. That's you know, what we deal with uh, normally. But then you got three kilometer deep flow domain. And then that, that's just totally unrealistic. You don't really have a three kilometer deep flow system for six kilometer uh, watershed. But that didn't bother him too much. So he went on and then applied this undulating uh, boundary condition, again, piezometric surface. And you get this famous diagram, uh, the local intermediate regional flow system. And but still you look at this, so the local flow system is only about a kilometer 
you know, in scale. That's just a first order stream. And yet you got a groundwater flow system that, that, that's a kilometer deep. So thousand meter deep local flow system for first order uh, watershed. And that just doesn't make sense. But Joe had to do this because he's limited to pencil and pen. So the aquifer homogeneous. So the only way to get this uh, with homogeneity um, with all the flow line is to have a, a very deep uh, flow system. Okay. Now, so there are other people who spotted the the oddity of this uh, model, and then that kind of came forefront in the uh, legendary uh, hydrology, hydrology symposium uh, in 1962 that was held at the campus of the University of Alberta, Calgary, which is uh, modern day University of uh, Calgary. So this took place uh, just uh, not a few minute walk from the building where my office is now. Uh, so this was uh, part of the international decade of hydro hydrology and then this was uh, coordinated by the National Research Council, the sub subcommittee on hydrology. So it, this is a kind of forerunner of a present day hydrology section of uh, Canadian Geophysical Union. So in those days, you know, symposium was a big deal. So the presenters will write the full paper with a bunch of figures, you know, typically six or seven pages long, and they'll submit it to the committee and they'll produce hard copies, no email back then. So hard copies and participants will receive a hard copy of all the papers and they're supposed to read them before they come to Calgary. And then proceedings were actually proceedings. They recorded whoever said anything, you know, discussions and questions. Some of them was actually typing or just, you know, <clears throat> taking notes. And that was published as a proceeding. So that's the backdrop here. It's quite a bit different from uh, present day scientific uh, conferences. Now, so the task, uh, Joe presented that, you know, diagram, uh, regional local uh, intermediate flow system. And then there was a discussion and this is what Peter Maiboom said. He had already left a research council at Alvada. He was already working at the GSC at the time. So Joe's assumption that the medium of groundwater flow in a small uh, drainage basins may be treated as a homogeneous is contrary to all the geological observations in Western Canada. So that's a pretty strong word. Uh, but you know, it's, it's true that it, it's kind of odd to have such a homogeneous system so deep. So my boom uh, proposes another model, which is again legendary now, the pra prairie profile. So you got this uh, aquifer, typically glacial till of some sort, clay rich sediments, and then you got this aquifer. And then recharging, this recharge is uh, feeding this aquifer and then aquifer is putting water out as some, uh, you know, the sloughs and lakes or the uh, the creeks here. So, you know, the, both Toss and my boom had great ideas. On one hand, Toss's idea puts a mathematically sound foundation of the groundwater treatment. So now you can talk about a lot of theories and you're on a stable ground, but yet it's not realistic, geologically speaking. But yet my, my boom has a you know, idea that's actually matches the observation, but really this is still conceptual. So there's gotta be a way to reconcile, you know, the strength of both ideas, right? Now enters this young man uh, from, uh, well, he was just graduating from the Queen's University. And then he, you know, talked to Joe, and talked to my boom. Uh, my boom was actually his boss at the GSC. And then there was this, you know, the, the, he was, later on he told me, uh, Alan Fries, uh, I was at the right place at the right time. So the digital computer was emerging and then there's, you know, Fortran program. So he wrote this final difference, uh, 3D groundwater flow model. And this was uh, the first offering of the uh, Fries Witherspoon trilogy. So the first one, 1966, so every year. So there was another one, another one, right? Like Harry Potter. <coughs> so, uh, Readers of water resources research will just anticipate when's the next freeze and results from coming out. Uh, and then, so, so GSC, okay, so the freeze was an employee of a GSC under Peter uh, Maiboom. Uh, so back in those days, you know, 
So even though the freeze was uh, going to the University of California, Berkeley, to work with the Witherspoon, but he had a three months off in summer. So he'll come back to Ottawa and uh, work with uh, Peter Maiboom on the, on the field work, you know, field based hydrogeological investigation. And he wrote actually a master's thesis using uh, the data he collected with the Maiboom. Uh, so that was a Gravelberg aquifer. It's, it's a little town um, in southern Alberta, just halfway between Medi the uh, Swift Current and the Moose Joe. Um, now, so he actually used his data from this Gravelberg aquifer for the first offering of the, uh, the trilogy. So he actually sets up a, a transect using actual topography and um, somewhat realistic hydro the geology based on the borehole uh, drilling, and it generates this uh, equipotential line. So this is not really unsimilar to my boom's uh, prairie profile. So there, there, he was able to reconcile those two ideas. Mathematically rigorous treatment of groundwater, yet that's geologically uh, realistic. But then uh, they had the limitations in the early days of computing. Uh, so for example, he could only get K1 to K2 ratio, the, the aquif aquitar and aquifer, 1 to 50. But we know in reality it's 1 to 1,000 or even 1 to 10,000 in the prairies. So those have to wait. You know, the realization of this um, <coughs> more of uh, uh, the difficult tasks in America, they will wait for a, <clears throat> a bit more time. Now, so in, in the very first paper, uh, uh, Fries and Witherspoon puts out, um, so openly acknowledges, well, we are using water table as the top boundary condition, but really this should be done in the manner that, you know, uh, honors or the reflects the recharge processes. So in other words, you got to have the beta zone. Ground surface should be the top boundary of the model and you got to solve recharge equation. But it's my PhD thesis. We, we just don't have that kind of time. So we just can go ahead with the water table uh, boundary condition. But then he graduates um, a few years later and he gets back, goes back to uh, GSC as a full time employee. And then he was dispatched to the West again, and he does two things. One is the very serious field study of unsaturated zone hydro hydrology at uh, the uh, one of the uh, IA, IHD, uh, Inter IDH, International Decade of Hydrology Basin, uh, Good Spirit Lake, uh, Saskatoon, which is near Yorkton. Um, and then uh, he also does the development of variably saturated 3D flow model. So this is uh, the stuff that's more advanced than his PhD thesis. This is a picture from uh, his first paper on this 3D uh, variably saturated flow model. You see the recharge and there is a water table and the Velo zone. And then there is a stream as well. So he was actually already coupling a 3D uh, basal zone uh, flow model with a, a stream channel uh, with a relatively simple scheme, you know, seepage phase and uh, water exchange. So with this, he was able to simulate uh, the potential distribution, the equipotentials uh, with the water table and the basal zone, and also he can generate the storm uh, runoff uh, hydrograph uh, with the model. Now, at the same time, or just slightly before publication of this paper, uh, he puts out this, you know, now <coughs> legendary again, uh, the paper on the blueprint of hydrological model. So he had a, um, a co-author, Dick Harlan. Uh, so Dick Harlan worked in the same building as Alan Fries, um, but he was with the fishery um, and the ocean, uh, but he, they, they commuted, you know, the, together in a carpool. So they would discuss ideas and then just ended up in this uh, blueprint. And then this uh, first you know, model Freeze made, uh, published in 1972, was a partial realization of this uh, blueprint. And then uh, we had to wait for almost 30 years to have a fully realized uh, model uh, of a blueprint, um, such as in-HM, integrated hydrological model, or hydrogeosphere. Uh, those two are both from Waterloo. Um, that actually came out um, just about, you know, when, when Steve and I were still around, or just Steve was finished, maybe I was still around. And then Power Flow, and there are a whole bunch of others uh, who, that does the same thing now. So um, 
but you know, at the time, and as soon as Please publishes this uh, blueprint and then his models. And there are all, all, always you know, people asking, really, do these models actually simulate the real processes? So Freeze uh, took upon himself to team up with a person named Gold uh, Stevenson from Idaho uh, at the uh, Reynolds Creek uh, <coughs> Research Basin. So th this is one of the uh, IDH basins. So Canada had a bunch of IDH basin, US had a bunch. But Reynolds Creek is still there. It's one of the critical zone observatory. Was all the Canadian one? They're just gone. So, uh, anyways, so he go to this, uh, get the data from uh, the Reynolds Creek, and then he he puts out a model. And so this is very well characterized. The geology is characterized. So there are a whole bunch of tensiometers, soil moisture sensors, water table well on the uh, <coughs> slope. And then he tries to simulate, you know, uh, the transient processes. And then, so for the stream discharge, he did reasonably well. So this is the total discharge. Uh, and then, so this is a grand order uh, input to the, the stream. So the uh, thin dash lines, uh, uh, field based estimation, and then thick dash line is a freezes model. So they do reasonably good job. Um, but on the other hand, internal state variables such as moisture content, water table, model didn't do a good job at all. So you know, he tried a bunch of calibration. He tried his best, but he just couldn't get internal state variable to match the field data. So the problems are uh, the model, it was highly sensitive, Mo model result was highly sensitive to the unsaturated flow parameters, um, equivalent of van Lachten coefficient we use in our models now. Uh, and it's really difficult to determine the field, those you know, unsaturated flow parameters. And then it, it, he was not able to match the internal state variables. And then this is a famous quote, uh, data are the Achilles heel of uh, blueprint style deterministic physics based model. And then after this, he never went back to this kind of modeling. Instead, he started stochastic analysis. So running thousands of model simulation, Monte Carlo analysis using much simpler models that are easy to run. So that was the path uh, Freeze took after this. So that's you know, something to think about uh, <coughs> today uh, for us. OK, so I'll just I'll switch the topic uh, here and then I just forgot to put my stopwatch. So I'm not where you're <laughs> sure where I am in time, but that's OK. Dave says it's OK, it's OK. <laughs> and I have a sip of water. Yeah, yeah, this doesn't have vodka or anything yet. <laughs> so there's another major event uh, in which the Canadian hydrologists made a huge contribution. That's the paradigm shift in hill slope hydrology. So before 1960s, um, you know, people thought that this is a pre-storm. You know, this is a kind of dry time. Uh, so there's a water table, there's a base flow to the stream, and then there's a soil moisture uh, profile. So the overland flow, the runoff occurs because of the rainfall intensity is just so high that it exceeds the infiltration capacity of the uh, soil. Um, and then, you know, you get the saturated zone right at the surface and then the runoff. Uh, so that's called the Horton overland flow. Uh, so that was kind of, you know, pre 1960s, uh, kind of sim similar to what the theoretical physics was before Einstein uh, came around. And then, so in the 60s, uh, there were actually some um, people, um, you know, doing this blasphemy. They actually started going to the field and making observations instead of just believing in the model. So they said, well, there's no hold in the overland flow. So the runoff, the overland flow tends to be generated in this riparian zone where the water table comes up to the surface. So that does two things. One, it pushes the groundwater into the, uh, uh, onto the surface first and then into the stream. So it's called a return flow of groundwater. And then because the direct gradient is upward, there's zero infiltration of rain. So that just rain joins this return flow of groundwater and it goes into the stream. So that's called a saturation overland flow. So there are half a dozen papers really contributed to 
uh, this conceptual model. But the one that stands out is uh, by a young PhD student named Tom Dunn. Uh, so he was uh, uh, working on his PhD at uh, Johns Hopkins, and then uh, later on he became a prof at the University of Washington. But when he published this high, highly influential paper, he was working at, a universe, at the uh, McGill University. So I kind of claim this as a Canadian contribution. So uh, this, uh, for his PhD thesis, he was looking at this uh, small <coughs> first order catchment in New England. Uh, and then he sets up this uh, trench uh, and then, so th this trench has a cross section uh, looking like this. So th it's got a three uh, outflows, a surface one and one in the middle using a tile and another one using a tile. And then, so he measures the flow coming from three outlets and then plots a hydrograph like this. So, so this one he calls a deep subsurface flow that's coming from this tile. That's you know, increases a bit, but it's a small contribution. And then shallow subsurface flow collected by this tile, and it puts up. And then really the biggest contribution comes from the saturation overland flow. And another uh, major observation he made is that this saturated area along the riparian fringe actually grows during the storm. So the land of gener generating area does not remain constant. It just varies. So variable source area. So those are a major paradigm shift in hydrology. And uh, so, in, so Tom Dunn, while he was at McGill, make another contribution in a sense that that was probably not intended. That was to inspire Alan Fries to look at this using his newly formulated numerical model. Uh, 3D, unsaturated, saturated, coupled with a stream channel. So this is what uh, Alan Fries does uh, in this 1972 paper. So it, you know, find a difference. Emil Friend was not in the scene yet. Um, so it was Fries doing all the finite different, uh, the different stuff. And then he sets a model for a slope and it's kind of reasonable rainfall intensity. Uh, and then, you know, so the greatest thing as far as I can see uh, about these models is that you can do the the hypothesis testing or what if analysis. Just try to deepen your understanding of hydrological processes rather than trying to simulate the actual you know, field observation, which freeze miserably failed. So um, for example, okay, well this slope has a you know, medium sand or something, high hydraulic conductivity, uh, 10 to minus three. Okay, so majority of storm flow is generated by subsurface flow. Um, so that's the water table for this simulation. And then increase, decrease the hydraulic conductivity by order of magnitude. Okay, but well it does not infiltrate it uh, as well. So a lot of that actually shows up as saturation overland flow. So using this model, Freeze actually uh, provided, you know, rigorous physics-based foundation for the paradigm shift that was taking place, mainly led by the field-based hydro hydrologists. So that's you know, something interesting we can learn from. That just modelers and field-based observers working together can generate some great uh, things. Okay, so there's another piece to it, which is Canadian. Um, so before 1960s, you know, the storm hydrograph was you know, picture like this. Okay, so this is a storm flow, uh, and a lot of that is overland flow. Um, so that's what everybody thought, you know, uh, before then. But now we know it's this only applies to parking lot uh, hydrology. Uh, and then there was a young PhD student again. There's a lot of young PhD students here, and even some great hydrogeologists. It used to be just one young PhD student. So Canadian uh, PhD student named with a George Pinder from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, so the Pinder uh, went to University of Illinois. Uh, first, he thought he was going to do a PhD on uh, Pleistocene geology because he, he did that you know, excellent undergrad thesis on Pleistocene geology. And he kind of meets another uh, Canadian uh, named John Cherry. And then Cherry tells him in his you know, classic manner, well, you don't want to be doing Pleistocene geology. You want to be doing hydrogeology. I'll hook you up with my supervisor named Bob Verbogen. So uh, 
Pinder goes to Bob, and, and then um, Bob, you know, takes him on. And then again, back in those days, you know, the university was only nine months, the three months, you know, student went somewhere else and worked. So Bob uh, hooks him up, hooks Pinder up with uh, Department of Mines, a groundwater division of uh, Nova Scotia, and then sends, you know, uh, Pinder up to Halifax, uh, and then Pinder was supposed to be working there and getting some data for his uh, PhD. So he was taking a lot of statistics courses. Um, so he was going to look at, you know, influence of groundwater on stream chemistry, but he was going through this uh, then, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, advanced technique called a factorial analysis. So he will pick three streams and the three sampling location, upstream, middle stream, and downstream. So that's three by three, and then 21 sampling events. So over a course of about 40 days, you'll take 21 samples. Now, so that's what you can read in the paper, uh, but in, I you know, was really curious. So I just called him up uh, for a, a Zoom interview, and uh, uh, he says, well, you know, I couldn't do all this 21 samples. So what I did was I talked to the local people in the watershed and asked them to collect, you know, sample 21 times. And I was just telling George, oh, that's a citizen science, you know? <laughs> wow, you're doing it like 40, no, was it, 50 years ago? That's just really ahead of time. But anyways, that's what he did. Uh, so he did this factorial analysis and that was okay. But then he also had another idea because he had so many, you know, different samples from the same location. Okay, well, you can do this. So you got two components of uh, stream discharge, one from groundwater, but maybe from overland flow or something like that. So when you have multiple components, you can multiply the flow of uh, individual component by the concentration of individual component, and then total should add up to the total flow <coughs> times the average concentration of the stream. Um, so he applies that to the three uh, river basin, reasonably small. These are actually all IDH basins, International Decade of Hydrology. It's all gone by now. Uh, so this one's 6.5 square kilometer April block, not very far from Halifax. So he shows that, okay, a lot of this uh, storm flow is actually uh, groundwater. So this is another evidence, you know, this is more and more evidence coming to support the idea that groundwater is a major contributor of uh, storm flow. Uh, and then there's another piece. So at the time, um, so some universities uh, are acquiring this iso isotope mass spec. So now you can look at isotopic composition of a stable isotope of water, H, uh, deuterium and oxygen 18, and then uh, Peter Fritz was already here, uh, so he and his uh, masters and then PhD student Michael Sklash uh, did this. So they collected the samples from seven watersheds in Ontario and Quebec, did isotope uh, hydrograph separation, which is now, you know, common. Everybody knows about it. So again, he, they saw, showed that event water, so the rain coming from this particular rain event, is a minor contributor to the storm flow. A lot of that actually is an old water that was already in the soil or groundwater before the storm event. Um, and then uh, th there's one more piece that's needed to really solidify the idea. You know, the Wagner's, uh, the continental drift uh, theory needed some physical mechanism to actually form this up. So that came from none else, Bob Gillum. Uh, <coughs> So, uh, so he was a solid physicist, so he was really, you know, uh, versed with the concept of capillary fringe. Uh, so this is a, a highly influential uh, paper written by Bob Gillum. Um, and so I read this paper as a, a master's student in Japan. That's one of the reasons uh, why I came to Waterloo, because if Gillum is there, this must be a good place. <coughs> uh, and I knew nothing about contaminant hydrogeology work done by Gillum at, uh, at that point. So, okay, when you have a water table here at the, uh, location A, so capillary fringe is about 20 centimeters. So there's a big distance between the uh, ground surface and the top of the capillary fringe. So you gotta have a fair amount of infiltration to saturate the whole thing and bring the water table up. But then if 
the location is close to the stream, then capillary fringe is already close to the uh, ground surface. And it's easy to bring the water table up. And if you're already in the zone where the capillary fringe is reaching uh, the ground surface, you don't need any infiltration at all to bring the water table up. So that's, that is a mechanism that brings the water table up quickly and generate the saturation overland flow. And then, so it looks like this. And then that also allows this old water, the prevent water sitting in the uh, soil and the, uh, aquifer to just come out to the surface. So at that point, I think th this I see uh, as a last nail in the coffin. So the paradigm shift had occurred, and it's even in some textbooks of uh, groundwater. Uh, this is chapter six uh, of Freeze and Cherry. It actually has the diagram in the right orientation uh, for this chapter cover. Um, and uh, uh, so the, the freeze, you know, has this diagram showing the concept of saturation overland flow uh, based on his modeling and also the, uh, Tom Dunn's uh, research. So this chapter, um, in my view, was really, you know, uh, novel at the time. In addition to the transport uh, chapter and the chemistry chapter for hydrogeology textbook. Now, so I'll just wind the clock a little bit, okay? Uh, going back to the story of this guy. Uh, so he left uh, the Research Council of Alberta in 1960 to work on his PhD with the Burke Maxi at uh, University of Illinois. And after completion, the Maxi left Illinois, so he replaced Maxi as a, a professor of hydrogeology. And that's when he met uh, with John Cherry and George Pinder and some great people there. Uh, but then 1967, uh, Western University uh, recruited him to come in as a, a hydrogeology uh, professor uh, there. And he stayed there for a few years, and then he moves to 1970. And you heard some of the, the rest of history in the uh, previous you know, <coughs> the speeches. Um, so, so really his uh, goal was to establish a center of uh, groundwater teaching and uh, research. And then, uh, so he hired uh, Cherry, uh, Friend, and Fritz. Um, so, you know, th this, I, I just kind of sidetrack uh, here a little bit, just to tell you about my personal story with uh, Bob. Um, so, um, summer of 1995, I was working in Sask Saskatoon in the field work for a couple months, and then I came back to Waterloo probably August sometime. And then in the meantime, I heard that Bob was ill with cancer, uh, but then I also heard that, well, he's recovering, you know, the treatment's going well at the Kitchener General Hospital, and he, he'll be coming out soon. That's my recollection. Dave may, may correct me, but uh, so that's what I thought and heard. So, okay, well, I should probably go see him at the Kitchener General Hospital. I don't know why I thought, but I thought, well, I gotta go see him. So uh, mid-August sometime, I just, you know, go to his uh, room in the Kitchener General Hospital, and then so as soon as I walk in, and then he said, young man, how are you? you know, I was going there to ask him, how are you doing? But the first thing he says, how are you? And then, wow, this is, you know, something. And I told him, well, you know, I'm finishing up my uh, field work for PhD, and uh, soon I'll be writing his thesis. I didn't know that it's going to take another two years <laughs> at that point. <laughs> Anyways, that's common to everybody, right? So, uh, so, so, oh, that's great. So what are you going to do? Um, well, I haven't thought that much ahead, and I just want to finish my PhD. And he looked at me and says, what? Well, you got to go out, out of Waterloo, and then spread the knowledge, the great knowledge, you know, we have, you know, taught in the course to you, to the rest of the world. That's you know, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but that's what he says, you know, and, and I actually took it to myself. Wow, well, that's, you know, his, his vision at, at that time. And then as some of you know, uh, he did not actually recover. Um, he passed maybe a month after my meeting with Bob in the Kitchener General Hospital, but I really took it, you know, uh, with me, his word, you know, just spread the great knowledge uh, to the rest of the world. Um, but but so so that was uh, part of it, and then I was curious about the hiring of these three people, and then I asked Bob. So what, what was your vision? Uh, so this is actually his own word, you know. So he wanted 
assemble a team of hot shots, he says, you know. So these are hot shots from different fields, no overlap. Yeah? Just get different you know, people just to work together and they can produce some great things. So John Cherry, of course, you know, um, hydrogeology, great in geochemistry. And then Emil Friend, um, he brings this then brand new finite element method for new numerical modeling. And then Peter Fritz, of course, isotope. No one else was doing isotope in uh, Canada at the time. And then this was joined uh, shortly by Bob Gillum, uh, bringing solar physics. So, um, so that's how he built uh, this, you know, the great, uh, great place, uh, uh, Wolaloo. Okay, so another thing um, the, uh, that happened in the early days is the establishment of uh, Borden site. Uh, so this was a landfill leachate study in the beginning. Uh, so there was, this was spearheaded by John Cherry, and this is a. a introduction of a special issue of Journal of Hydrology on this leachate landfill study. Uh, so the aim was to understand uh, the groundwater process in a field setting, you know, uncontrolled field setting where the, there's a lot of unknowns and uncontrolled process as opposed to lab and modeling, which you have a comfort of knowing all the conditions. So that was a vision. I think we benefited greatly from uh, this approach. Uh, and then so this was driven by the societal need, you know, to understand uh, the fate and transport of contaminants, so the environmental pollution. So we needed, you know, the trained hydrogeologists uh, who had knowledge on this. And then he uh, and uh, John and Bob uh, uh, <coughs> published this editorial um, in the Journal of Geology. Uh, are we prepared for the 21st century? Um, so it was a really, you know, the uh, foresighted. So the, what they worried was that we geologists need to be in the lead for the things that are happening underground. If we don't, people from other disciplines are gonna take over who may not have a thorough understanding of uh, geology. So they, he also, uh, this paper also asks, what will young geologists be doing the next century, which is now? So I think it, it was just really quite a foresight uh, those uh, people had in the early days of uh, Waterloo uh, Hydrogeology Group. Okay. So I'm not going to talk much about contaminant hydrogeology because that's out of scope of uh, the paper that Garth and I wrote, uh, but Contaminant hydrogeology study uh, generated a lot of uh, great idea for the fundamental understanding of groundwater hydrology. For example, that Gillum's uh, uh, concepts of capillary fringe generating stormwater runoff uh, was, you know, experiments were conducted at the Borden site. And then this is the famous Ed Siddiqui's a natural gradient tracer test that really enhanced our understanding of solid transport processes. And then all this, you know, field-based studies uh, inspire the modelers to develop newer and better and better models. Um, so uh, th that resulted in the implementation of Blueprint by uh, Joel Van der Kroc, uh, who are my contemporaries, Stephen and uh, I had uh, some time with Joel. And then, so that uh, was also um, morphed into hydrogeosphere. Um, so Steve Shikaze was actually uh, involved in part of it, the Flux 3DV, I guess it was still called. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so that was a great thing. But there are other great things. Um, oh, okay. So the other thing uh, uh, which, you know, the contaminant hydrogeology required is understanding of uh, aquitar. You know, so you, you got you know, clay till, um, which should be permeable, uh, impermeable, but then when you got cracks and fractures, it may become permeable, and that's bad news for uh, containing uh, contaminants such as nuclear waste. So there are a lot of uh, research going on in Waterloo. Uh, this is Kent Keller's uh, MSc thesis um, in Saskatchewan, and this is Larry McKay's uh, PhD thesis in Sarnia, uh, Ontario. And then, so there's a great understanding of diffusion uh, that was advanced because of this uh, <coughs> contaminant hydrogeology study. This is Vicky Remenda. Uh, she was not working on contaminant, but this was a site that was uh, considered for nuclear waste uh, disposal, a uh, woman, Saskatchewan. Uh, so there are lots of, you know, there's numerous accomplishments made, made by numerous masters and PhD students. Uh, just too many uh, to introduce here. 
And there are numerous students coming into Waterloo because Waterloo became the mecca of uh, hydrogeology. Um, so Ed Siddiqui mentioned the golden era or golden period of uh, Waterloo. I was lucky to be right in the middle of it uh, in the early 90s to mid uh, 90s. Uh, so here's my arrival, uh, maybe a year or so after my arrival. Um, so Ryan Wilson, Stan Bobian, and then I was you know, discussing with Steve and Steve Shikaze would normally in this picture, but if he's not, so I suspect actually he took uh, this picture. So this is a, right in front of our portable office, P5, uh, just located in the, the south of uh, Karl Pollock uh, Hall. Now, so, you know, I came from Japan, right? I mean, the foreign students here, I mean, you have that experience coming from foreign countries and you don't feel comfortable, you're a little bit nervous. And then Ryan Wilson and uh, his then newlywed wife, Nancy, uh, well, took me out, you know, in early days. Uh, well, Masaki, why don't you come for you know, dinner with us? Um, and then uh, to a place called the East Side Mario. So I think it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, well, that's great, you know. Uh, and then so we walk in and then so you, you know, you're always busy. So it was a Friday uh, uh, evening, I think. So we have to wait and you guys go to the bar area and then just wait and you know, sipping beers and that, right? So I, I don't know now, but back in those days, so they'll give you a beer and a bucket of peanuts with a shell. And then so I just looking at the people and then, OK, well, this is how you eat peanuts. Just unshell the peanuts and throw it in my mouth. So what do you do with a shell? <laughs> so there's this much, you know, de deposits of peanut shells on the floor. I was horrified, you know. <laughs> I remember writing to my parents, well, in Canada, we have a different standard of cleanness, you know, <laughs> compared to Japan. <laughs> but anyway, so Ryan and Nancy were just so, you know, warm and welcomed me, and then that, you know, became a lifelong friend. Uh, so was Steve and Stan Bobian, who's now in Rome, uh, Italy. So, uh, so, so. You know, those of you who came from, uh, you know, foreign countries, uh, just, you know, enjoy the company of, uh, you know, your friends, uh, particularly the Canadian students. Um, and then shortly after that, Steve took me to his home for Christmas. Uh, and then that was pretty memorable. Yeah. Uh, now, another thing you would notice, um, you know, people would have observant eyes, such as Dave Smith, is uh, this. So there's a hole. <coughs> in my jeans. But you know, this was before the days I started fixing my clothing with the duct tape. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's why the mention of um, duct tape by Dave. Uh, and then I'll, I'll also work late at night, but I'll have a dinner. Mr. Noodles, uh, yeah, we, we, we had a kitchen in BFG building where I was able to cook Mr. Noodles for dinner. Anyway, so that's, so yeah, I sidetracked uh, quite a bit. Um, so anyway, so that was a time uh, when the scope of the hydrogeology was uh, diversifying. Uh, for example, my PhD thesis, uh, well, Dave, this is for you, the picture of the slew. Uh, my PhD thesis uh, was in uh, Saskatchewan, in near Saskatoon. So I was working on this prairie slew of prairie wetlands. Uh, so looking at interaction of groundwater with um, wetlands in this case, and there are other people looking at the streams as well. Um, so uh, people started doing this kind of things, not just in Waterloo, but uh, Canada uh, <coughs> in general. So this is a figure from my PhD uh, thesis uh, many years ago. Dave was on it. Um, so th there was a cycle of uh, water, uh, overland flow, bringing snowmelt into uh, this wetland, and then just groundwater flow carries back to that plant. There's a cycle of water and the solute uh, as well. Uh, and then, so you notice a little trees uh, uh, on the schematic uh, diagram. Uh, we used to not draw trees if it was a hydrogeological uh, cross section, but trees there because it's important. That tree is there because of the shallow water table. Uh, it's a dry place in the prairie. So there is groundwater supporting the tree, but this tree is actually taking up water. So that creates this flow. So it's a two way linkage of uh, groundwater with the ecosystem. That's called eco hydrology now. So that was a kind of fringe discipline still emerging uh, at the time. And then there are other people, uh, Dave and Ed Say, my colleague now, department head actually in, uh, in my department, uh, went to the Kintore Creek uh, 
in southern Ontario uh, looked at the effects of groundwater discharge uh, to the creek and also the tile drain uh, as well. It's interesting, you're still doing tile, tile drains. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so those are important, you know, things that you know happens because of the interaction of groundwater with the surface water. And then there are people uh, looking at the fish. So this is a paper by biologists from uh, Guelph. So the fish pick spawning areas depending on the groundwater discharge conditions, and then they were actually using hydrogeological monitoring devices such as a seepage meter and a piezometer uh, to spot and measure the fluxes. And of course, seepage meter was invented by uh, David Lee when he was actually uh, in water uh, right here. And then, so the time goes on. I'm not going to tell you too much about what happened after 2000, um, but now we're at the point where the provincial uh, agencies are considering surface water, groundwater interaction as part of their policy development and regulations. So BC is actually uh, quite a bit ahead uh, probably a decade ahead of Alberta, uh, but uh, so when you have a, a well right by the stream, so you need to think about those things uh, for determining a sustainable pumping rate. And then climate change uh, came to the forefront uh, of uh, um, just about any science, natural science, but hydrogeology as well. Uh, so this is an example of uh, Diane Allen and then her master's student, uh, Yasek Sibek uh, from Simon Fraser. Uh, so looking at the Grand Fork uh, Aquifer in BC uh, using climate change scenario. So what would be the water level? Uh, uh, this is 2040, so 50, uh, 40 years from now. So this is uh, early spring, so the water level is higher than now because snow melt is higher. But then late summer water table is lower because you know the snow melt gets higher. That means the tail end of the snow melt uh, comes earlier as well. And uh, 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 this is uh, by John Sykes and uh, his uh, former student, and uh, I think uh, he became a research associate, uh, um, Mikko Yerikama, uh, for Grand River right here. Uh, so this is a climate change scenario of temperature increase of uh, about three degrees, a precipitation increase of 20%. What does that impact groundwater recharge? Um, but you know, the majority of, if not all of these climate change impact study on groundwater is uh, model based. Um, so because it's just so hard to get the long time time series of groundwater going back 50, 60 years, because for climate change analysis, you do need long term data. But I was talking to uh, Steve Hollish uh, from uh, the Oak Ridge's Moraine Conservation Authority, and they actually have a long term Data. So there are probably cases like that we can actually look at to, you know, examine the impact of uh, climate change. Okay, so here is a key observation. So what stands out? Uh, I, I'm not biased here. So really, from neutral observers' eye, what stand out is a both avoidance uh, contribution. Uh, so you know, he established uh, uh, Alberta Research Council's groundwater. This division that really started a scientific study of groundwater and trained the future leaders such as Maibum, uh, Bill Manelli, Joe Toth. And then, of course, he founded the groundwater group here. And then because of Bob, we're, uh, uh, we're all here today. And then that Calgary 1962 symposium, I think that's legendary. And then that left a legacy, even though we don't really feel it. Um, for example, that were, there was, you know, serious debate of mathematical rigor versus, you know, the realistic geology. How can we reconcile it? And then that motivated the work of Alan Fries. And then the blueprint and the rest is history as far as the numerical modeling uh, goes. So the from um, where Garth and I stand. Uh, so these are a couple of future challenges. One is climate change. Uh, so to do address that, we need the long-term data. Canada didn't do a great job maintaining long-term research basins. All the IDH basins gone, whereas in the US, we still have a critical zone observatories. Uh, uh, some of them are actually the legacy of uh, IDH, International Decade of Hydrology. And we also want to look at two-way feedback between groundwater and the ecosystem, uh, plants <coughs> in particular. Um, so here's a disclaimer. So the, by and large, some of the things are neutral, but uh, this is our 
retrospective. Garth and I, we looked at the literature and this is what I thought we thought we should include in the paper. So there's a lot more stories uh, which you know we could not pick up or we could not cover. So this is the last slide uh, in my Favolden lecture. Um, so I wasn't looking at the watch, but I'm still OK. <laughs> so um, when Garth and I were writing this paper, by the way, uh, if you want this paper, just email me anytime. Uh, so we you know, thought about how do we finish uh, this paper, last paragraph uh, in the paper. And Garth thought, well, it will probably be appropriate to end the paper with the last remark made by Bob Fabolden at the legendary uh, Calgary uh, Symposium. So he said, uh, I would like to suggest that it is the lack of hindrance by regulation or custom that has enabled participants, which included my boom, Toth, and all other people, to test new ideas and produce the stimulating results presented at this symposium. And when Garth and I read this, so I, we thought this is still relevant today, for example, regulation. Uh, are we not controlled by research direction by funding agencies or the university administration? You know, Other people want to dictate our research directions, uh, not based on scientific curiosity, but something else. And also, are we kind of staying inside? Like, are we not thinking outside the existing paradigm? Like, Tosse's groundwater flow system concept wouldn't be there if he just believed the Hubbard you know, paradigm. Uh, so those are the, the few things I thought I would uh, leave with you. And then thank you again for having me here. It's such an honor. Yeah, thanks. Okay, we have time for some and, and we have two volunteer mic runners here. These previous grad students, all three of us. So how about a question for our, our uh, visitor and our speaker today? We'll start with Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Masaki, for that. Greatest hits of the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> Historians of science refer to what you've told us as the history of great men in science. Sometimes great women like Nandita, mm -hmm. we celebrated today. But really there's, there's a complementary side in the history of science. And that's the introduction of instruments and pieces of equipment. Um, in microbiology, they, the first thing you hear about is the introduction of a microscope and Robert Koch's development of germ theory and the use of laboratory techniques. And I, I believe that the, the use of particular pieces of equipment or um, measurements based on equipment is really the forcing function that lets the great men and the great women come to those conclusions. And that's that's the complementary side. A and it's absolutely critical. And yesterday we were talking a bit about piezometers. And yes, indeed, it was uh, my boom who introduced into hydrogeology the piezometer, at least in the Canadian hydrogeology. Mm. But it had been used, you know, long before by Tetsagi and soil mechanics, and Fries would have known of that. And what Tetsagi, what Maibum was looking at was the Dutch literature that Garth knows well. And really, we need to kind of rattle Garth's cage out there in Nanaimo <laughs> and he's, where he's composting away and get him <laughs> to write a history how the Dutch came to develop the piezometer and actually the cone penetrometer as well, which we do, they were doing before World War II. But 
reading my boom, it's very clear that the piezometer was critical. And when my boom did the prairie profile, he did it on the basis of farm wells, not the piezometer. It was when he went to GSC and with the, the, um, the start in 63 of the international hydrological decade that I think money was freed up that he could actually create piezometer nests. Mm. And in one of each one of the nests, they'll put a Stevens F recorder on them. And so by 67, so between 63 and 67, the GSC instrumented various basins with piezometers. Mm. When I got to Chalk River in 72, Al Fries had already been there mm. and he had standpipe piezometers already installed in one of the basins there. And he'd analyzed the results with Vorslev's slug test, which tells you that Vorslev, a soil mechanics expert with the US Army Corps of Engineers, he'd been using them a long time before. So there was a history, but it was my boom going back, incorporating the piezometer into hydrogeology mm. that was really critical and let Al Fries do what he did. Mm. Uh, to actually simulate and show the strong effects of heterogeneities. Without piezometers, I mean, contaminant hydrogeology would be unthinkable. Mm -hmm. How will we measure heads, flow direction, and, and, and take water, groundwater quality? But also, you know, the, it was the use of um, isotopes that was critical. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do think that... Um, also improved computers were terribly important. I believe Freeze left to go to IBM because there he could mm. work on the on the latest computers at Yorktown Heights. And I believe he working in Berkeley gave him access to computers that we didn't have access to in Environment Canada. So all of these things were really forcing functions that allowed scientists like the, the great men you've talked about, to do what they did. And it is the, it's the complementary side of the history of hydrogeology. So anyhow, thank you once again, Masaki. But um, we need to get Garth thinking about pisometers. <laughs> totally agree, yeah. <laughs> In the back, Michael. <laughs> Can you comment on the implications for agriculture of the Canadian advances in hydrogeology in the context of places where you have very intense agriculture, where you have major soil subsidence and major problems with salinification? Uh, such as, for example, the California Central, Imperial, and San Joaquin Valleys? Yeah, so um, we did not really come across with um, the impacts of uh, heavy pumping on uh, land substance in the Canadian uh, context. There's a lot of examples uh, uh, outside, uh, but it's here. Um, under the watch of uh, Bob for Bolden, you know, the, there was a study of uh, land substance in uh, Mexico City. And so there were Canadian researchers um, looking at impacts of uh, heavy pumping and uh, land subsidence, um, not necessarily the agricultural uh, pumping. Um, in the case of Mexico City, it was actually uh, for uh, uh, water supply for the, the city. Uh, and then uh, again, so the, the the other another factor is uh, the nitrate uh, and other uh, further further applications. Um, and there has been a lot of studies both in Waterloo and then other universities in Canada. Uh, but we really kind of stayed away from purely you know uh, contaminant uh, side of the the story. But it, it is you know really important. Uh, so maybe there, there could be a paper uh, on the history of a contaminant hydrogeology in Canada. Misaki, uh, I was uh, really taken by the juxtaposition of two, uh, I guess, sides of hydrogeology in your talk. One being the uh, the discovery or, or 
revealing of ideas like Toth's uh, hand calculations and highly simplified systems. And then the other, the refinement of those ideas to I think what would become maybe a more practically important uh, look at the system that Freeze did with the modeling. You need the geological complexity to do anything practical, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing that struck me about that was that without the idea there that Toth had given, it would have been a lot harder to adopt the sort of practical advances that we enjoyed later on. And I wondered if you wanted to pick up that theme and and just talk about the the balancing of, of conceptual versus practical. Yeah, that's a very good point, Rick. Um, you know, I, I often think about that to myself, but like you say, we need to have a, you know, the solid foundation based on physics and mathematics. Um, even to talk about, you know, the deviation from, you know, what's expected. So I think Toth theory had to come first uh, before uh, my boom would object it and then freeze, you know, <coughs> shows up to reconcile those two ideas. So it, I think it's really important to have that, you know, solid mathematical foundation because otherwise we cannot talk about numbers. Uh, uh, without numbers, you know, you cannot really debate, you know, correct hypothesis versus wrong hypothesis. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not really, you know, putting it in an eloquent manner, but I think both are important, and particularly the, the first. With a, quick, a, a quick extra question that maybe will help you to um, uh, focus on, on something to, to latch on to there. And that is, uh, which do you think maybe is the more important contribution, the idea or the polishing of the idea for practical purposes later? And then follow that up with going to the future. Where are the ideas needed? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, it's, it's kind of almost obvious, but uh, without idea, there will be no improvement. So someone will have to come up with this, you know, um, the, uh, idea or a paradigm shift, uh, some sort of uh, seed uh, that, you know, uh, turns things around. But idea alone is not useful, as you say. So you, you need to have the other side where you can turn the idea into the practical tools. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my take. So the, in an academic setting like this, I think it's really important to train people who can create uh, the ideas and then where we're going in the future. Uh, it's hard to predict and I must say I didn't know where were we were, uh, were going to be 30 years down the road when I was a PhD student 30 years, you know, before. Um, but you know, I, I do ha think that the, uh, artificial intelligence machine learning will uh, play a, a role and I'm not sure what kind of role that is and if that's you know really good or not so good or maybe bad. So it remains to be seen that this generation uh, are the people who really take it to the next level and then use that with uh, you know great new ideas. <laughs> uh, thanks, a very interesting talk. Um, a number of years ago, I was at a conference where there were two keynote speakers back to back, and one was Keith Bevan, uh, followed by Ed Siddiqui. Mm. And it was very interesting, their different view of subsurface flow. Uh, obviously, Bevan, it was all about interflow, and Ed, of course, talked about 3D Richards equation and, and his new, you know, fully integrated models. And um, that I was sitting at, at a lunch table with uh, Diana Allen, and mm. that prompted a big discussion on the use of the term interflow. And I remember as a student here, we never used the term interflow. Whereas obviously, if if I was studying under Keith Bevan, that would be the worldview of subsurface storm flow. And I guess that um, actually, it wasn't, it was around the same time that I looked back at Freeze and Cherry and saw that Al Freeze really did talk about subsurface storm flow in, in quite a significant way mm -hmm. in his book. And also it caused me to look back at his 1972 paper, which you allude to here on subsurface storm flow. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can maybe 
talk about the role of hydrology and interflow in the Canadian setting. I mean, we're very much um, in Waterloo, it was very much about uh, porous media, um, whereas obviously in hydrology, it's very much about preferential flow pathways and interflow. Can you sort of elaborate on reconciling those two things and have they have they come together now? Um, uh, or what are your thoughts on that? That conundrum? Yeah, so interflow is uh, sort of an unfortunate, you know, um, thing because, you know, it's a really a catch all term for all the processes uh, during the storm, including, you know, groundwater flow, uh, shallow subsurface, saturated zone. Maybe there is some unsaturated flow in the capillary, uh, so the basal zone flow in capillary fringe. Um, so I don't, myself, I don't like the, the term interflow. I like to say, you know, uh, a word, word that actually signifies a mechanism, where the interflow is a catch-all. Uh, but Bevan, uh, I've never talked to him. I saw him once uh, uh, or twice in a conference. Um, but he, you know, really pushed for the idea about uh, admitting, you know, that what what we don't know. Um, so really, what equi equifinality is the, the word uh, he uses. So there will be, you know, hundreds of different models that will generate the same result as far as you're looking at the di storm discharge uh, hydrograph. So, so in a way, the interflow is honest because you're admitting that you don't know anything about, you know, the flow mechanism. It's something that comes between the water table and uh, ground surface. So as an educator, I never use the word interflow in my in my classes because I just don't like that you know notion of catch all for everything. Uh, but I'm not really answering your question in a straight uh, manner. But uh, yeah, uh, hopefully that <laughs> it's okay as an answer. Okay, checking the time here. I think we'll let Saki off the hook, and we will be able to carry on with more questions at our reception. Um, and uh, I'll mention that in a moment, but uh, please join me one more time. Uh, Masaki has demonstrated how we're all standing on such amazing shoulders of, of giants in our own country. Uh, and I can tell you that we all stand on this guy's shoulders too. He might not look that big or strong, <laughs> but he holds a lot of us. He's done a fantastic job. And uh, thinking about what's coming forward in the golden era, uh, thinking about the statistics that that uh, that we were seeing as hydrogeologists, we need to we need to promote this our discipline. We need to grow it again uh, and and move it on. So I think there's there's time for us all to work as a group to do that. But Saki, thanks so much for this, and we have a very special something for you. Oh yeah. So this is this is a tradition, and you not not know Masaki's wife is a is an artist. So this is a piece uh, of art, rock art, wow. for oh, rock stars. So thank you very nice. much. So where's the duct tape? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. We wanted to roll a duct tape, but we couldn't find one anywhere. <laughs> also, oh, it's so, all gone. <laughs> so those of you that don't know where the EIT building is, if you're stuck, there's going to be a river of folks walking, hopefully walking over there, but it's just around the outside of the Dana Porta Library, uh, followed across, and hopefully we'll see you there downstairs uh, where we used to always meet. So please come and join us. Thank you. <laughs>